let us examine our or let's study the normality theorem right within the realm of uh, linear and nonlinear estimators what does this normality theorem have to say okay so what it says is if random variables if random variables y x1 x2 all the way up to xn are jointly normal that is jointly gaussian normal means normal in the sense that they are jointly gaussian okay normal means gaussian with zero mean with zero mean then the linear and nonlinear estimators and nonlinear estimators of y estimators of y are in fact identical are are identical okay this is this is the statement of of this normality theorem and let's kind of look at the proof okay so what we wish to show is that the that uh, if you were to express y hat as a linear function of x1 to xn then it turns out that that is also the conditional mean under the condition that y and the the, the, and the observed random variables are all jointly gaussian okay now let y hat be a linear estimator of y that is it comes a summation ai xi where we are assuming that xi is carry information about y okay b a linear estimator clearly ai's are all constants as we have already seen the linear estimator of y okay linear mean square estimator of course now therefore y hat is equal to we know is a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus 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 up to a n x n now the claim let's claim the first claim is that y minus y hat this and this random variable and uh, xi any xi are jointly gaussian okay this is the first claim how does how does one show this okay this simply comes about because of the fact that if you write y minus y hat and if i have xi and suppose i express these two together as one random vector then i can express this as a linear transformation on applied on uh, on a vector that is of the form y x1 x2 all the way up to xn and okay, now this we know is jointly gaussian because right it's already mentioned in the statement okay theorem theorem statement has this that y x i is are all jointly gaussian or or jointly normal now if you look at y minus y hat right i can actually write this as 1 and then Minus y hat, so y hat is a one x one plus a two x two and so on. Therefore, right, we can simply write these coefficients. These entries is minus a one, minus a two, all the way up to minus a n. As far as x i is concerned, right, we can always write this as zero zero all the way up to maybe one where at the i th. Okay, so right, if this is the i th entry, entry in x. Okay, so somewhere you will have an x i. Right, corresponding to that, you will have a one, and then again followed by all zeros. I at entry well, uh, I let it let me say I at entry here, okay? Yeah, I at entry in X, correct? Uh, so out of here, X one to X and somewhere you'll have an I have an X I right with respect to that you'll have a one here. Uh, now what this actually means is that now now right because of the fact that right this is a linear transformation because this just consists of constants because of the fact that this is a linear transformation. Applied on a random vector, which is which is originally jointly Gaussian, and therefore this is also jointly Gaussian. A, li a linear transformation on as on a Gaussian random vector yields again a Gaussian random vector. So so the one on the left is also jointly Gaussian. By the way, when you say that something is jointly Gaussian, what it means is if you take any uh, any linear combination of these random variables, every linear any linear combination will again give you back a Gaussian random variable. Right, any linear combination you take, that will again return a Gaussian random variable. Okay, that is the most general statement regarding joint, joint uh, regarding random variables that are jointly normal. Okay, now here it's a linear transformation on this random vector which is jointly Gaussian, and therefore y minus y hat and x i hat is jointly Gaussian. Now, uh, 
moving forward uh, by the by the say, orthogonality principle or the projection theorem for random for linear mean square orthogonality principle or what is equally called the projection theorem right which we have seen projection theorem for for linear mean square estimator or the projection theorem for linear mean square estimator because our y hat is still a linear estimator we know okay we know that the error right which is y minus y hat expectation of the error y minus y hat with xi is equal to 0 correct and this comes from from our I say earlier this one earlier result which means which means which means that is y minus y hat and xi are or no orthogonal random variables are orthogonal random variables okay furthermore both y minus y hat and xi are both zero mean because y is zero mean all the xi's are zero mean therefore y minus y hat is zero mean and xi is of course zero mean and xi are both zero mean okay and we know that from standard random variable theory we know that or zero mean orthogonal random variables are uncorrelated are uncorrelated and because y minus y hat and xi are jointly gaussian and uncorrelated and uncorrelated they are statistically independent right this is this follows because of the fact that you have a gaussian gaussian situation right? if it was not gaussian we couldn't have made this statement right for for a gaussian random vector uncorrelatedness implies implies statistical independence they are statistically independent they are statistically independent correct so you know to, to to indicate it right normally so what we do is we indicate this as y minus y hat is orthogonal to xi and here we will indicate that y minus y hat is statistically independent of xi okay this is simply a notation right Therefore, if I compute expectation y minus y hat given xi x, let's say, okay, given the given the random vector x, okay, where x consists of x1 to xn, this is equal to expectation of y minus y hat, okay, because of the fact that this is independent of x, y minus y hat, right? We just now showed that it's statistically independent of x, and uh, because of the fact that y is zero mean and y hat is zero mean, this will be equal to zero. Now this further splits as expectation y given x minus expectation y hat given x and therefore on the right hand side we have 0 or in other words we have expectation y hat given x is equal to expectation y given x. However y hat is simply a function of x correct therefore okay here it's all it's all random vector x okay all the x1 to xn. And the y hat, right, given x is simply equal to y hat. Okay, because this one is simply equal to y hat. Once you give x, because y hat totally depends only on x. And therefore, the linear estimator that we started off with, because you see, if you, if you realize, we started with y hat being a, being a linear estimator, and this orthogonality principle also that we used for, used for, was also for a linear mean square estimator. And now what we have eventually concluded is that the y hat that we started off as a linear estimator is also the conditional mean. Therefore, therefore, okay, that kind of proves is equivalence. That means when the when what the unknown and the observed uh, and the and the and the observed random variables are all jointly Gaussian, then the conditional mean is linear in the in the in these observed variables. Okay, that means it will be a linear function of x, which which is what which is what it is in this case. Right, because you know that you know, you know that it is a linear function of x. Okay, that is the that is the normality theorem. Now, right, given all this background, we are now equipped to study the Weiner filter. 
Okay, given all that we have done till now, we are now equipped to study what is called the Weiner filter. And the Weiner filter again, right? I mean, it comes in various uh, contexts, including communication and all that. But then we are going to look at Weiner filter for the image deblurring problem. Okay, the Weiner filter. Okay, as we as as I said right in the beginning, our focus is going to be on the problem of image deblurring, right? In the for image deblurring, the Weiner filter for image deblurring. Now the, now the Weiner filter, right? I mean, until now, whatever whatever we did, right? Whenever we kind of showed a relation, okay, between I don't know whatever, right? When we said that we have a linear estimator or a nonlinear estimator, we did not make use of the uh, make use of the explicit relation between y and x. We only said that if x carries information about y, then basically what can be done. Now, as far as the deep learning problem is concerned, we have we have more information because of the fact that we know exactly what we observe and we know how it is related to the unknown. Because, for example, the observed image is blurred and noisy, and we know that it is related to the input image through a PSF. And, and basically, if you have some noise and in this case some noise statistics, okay, which you might be aware of, and therefore, it would like to incorporate all of that. I mean, right? That is something which you have not done courtesy till now. We only showed that the conditional mean exists, and then another you know, conditional mean is an MMSC, and then right, you know, it can also be linear, okay, under certain special conditions and so on. But uh, until now, we have not made use of the fact that uh, you no know, fact about how y and x are related. And for the deblurring problem, right, we are going to we are going to further utilize that relationship also in order to arrive at the Weiner filter. Okay, and the Weiner filter can be in the spatial domain. We will first derive it in the spatial domain, and then kind of look at its uh, look at its uh, look at its Fourier interpretation. Okay, now let us say that we want to find. Okay, now coming back to our image restoration problem or image deblurring problem. Okay, what we have is find an estimate of the clean image or original image, original, whatever clean, latent, okay, it comes, you know, it is called by different names, latent image F M N given a blurred and noisy observation and noisy observation G M N. See all the all the apparatus, right? That we have that we have seen till now really did not have per se anything to do with image processing, right? Deal condition, the deal position, the constraint least squared. Of course, off and on, I did indicate, right? If you had a deep learning problem, how you would probably you know how you would probably write down the cost function and so on. But really, right now we are kind of when we did CLS at the time, I indicated to you that how you would be able to use the observation model. Now again, now now again, it's time for a Weiner filter now, wherein we will try to make use of the observation model. Given a blurred and noisy observe, observe noisy. Given a blurred and noisy version, noisy observation G M N. Okay, noisy observation G M N of the right original image. Correct of F. Okay, so this is a noisy version of F. Now we know that the best MMSC, the best minimum mean square error estimator, MMSC estimator would be the would be the conditional mean, which will be f hat of m comma n is equal to conditional mean of f of m comma n given g let's say k comma l, where k comma l will both run from let's say one to n. Okay, so right, given the entire blurred and noisy observation g k n, the conditional mean of f given g k l would be would be would be the best. Minimum mean square mean square error estimator, but then this will be typically nonlinear. Okay, this will be nonlinear in G. Correct. This will be nonlinear in G, which is what you are observing. Okay, and uh, since since nonlinear estimators are kind of difficult to deal with, so we kind of restrict ourselves to a linear estimator. Right. So what do we do? So since the conditional mean is in general nonlinear, we settle down for we settle down for a linear estimator for the best, let's say, linear MMSC for the best linear minimum mean square error estimator MMSC estimator, which is that is we settle for f hat is equal to some h hat h hat h hat into g. Okay, this is simply a matrix of Constants, matrix of constants, right? So, so what this means is that, right? If you were to look at f hat of 
0 comma 0 which is the first intensity right in the focused image right that will be the first row of h hat that multiplies g okay so it's like it's like i'm observing all of g and i'm taking a linear combination of all the observer of all the observed intensities in g in order to be able to arrive at to say f hat and then these coefficients will have to be found out such that such that right that they they, they kind of right, give you so that expectation f minus f hat is as well if hat square is as small as possible Okay, and therefore, right, and uh, we know that e the the equivalent, equivalently, what this means is uh, finding, finding the or uh, the optimum h hat, right? Equivalently, finding the optimum h hat, finding the optimum h hat, okay, boils down to the condition, boils down to the condition, expectation f minus f hat f minus f hat g transpose is equal to 0. Remember f is a vector, f, f hat is a vector, g is a vector. Now, right, this is a matrix now. This is a matrix. Okay, now, matrix is zeros. Okay. Well, now, why is this suddenly coming up? Because of the fact that, right, I mean, if you had now as an aside, right, think about it. If you had x minus y and uh, if you have y to be a scalar and if your observation was also a scalar then then right then we had a we had just one equation okay then we extended this to the case when y minus y hat was still y was still a scalar but then we observed really a vector okay and then there we said xi is equal to is equal to zero and therefore right and therefore this meant that this whole thing right will for when you work it out for every xi then this becomes a vector Right, because then you have a vector of zeros. Now, instead of this, now what we have is y itself is now is now a vector, and and therefore, right, this condition of uh, of of this orthogonality, right. So, so this is nothing but but the say, orthogonality principle of this is based upon the orthogonality principle for for linear for linear mean square estimator. Okay, based upon that principle. It will turn out that y f minus f hat into g transpose gives you the zero matrix, or we can simplify this as expectation or expectation f hat. What is it? Or we have expectation f g transpose is equal to expectation f hat g transpose. Now, what do we have for f hat? Now, f hat by itself is h hat into g, correct? And therefore, what we have is expectation f into g transpose is equal to expectation f hat, which is h hat g, g transpose, or is equal to h hat expectation, because h hat is simply a constant matrix, matrix of constants. So, yeah, g, g transpose. Now, each is a vector here, okay, f is a vector. So, f g transpose is a matrix, this is a matrix, h hat is a matrix, and so on. Now we will actually bring in the observation model because until now, right, if you have observed, right, we have done exactly what we did for LMSE and so on, right. We haven't brought in anything regarding the relation between G and F. Now, now we know that G is equal to HF plus N, right. This is something that we know. And this H is the blur matrix, okay. This is different from H hat. H hat is our estimator. This is the blur matrix. Our blur matrix is H. And therefore, right, what we can do is we can write this as expectation f into g transpose. So g is this, well, g transpose will be f transpose h transpose plus n transpose is equal to h hat into expectation g g transposes h f plus n into g transposes f transpose h transpose plus n transpose. So if you simply expand this then and then right, if you try to push uh, push your expectation inside, then you'll get expectation f f transpose into h transpose plus expectation f into n transpose. Each is a matrix. Okay, please observe. Is equal to h hat into right expectation. Now, now it'll be h f f transpose h transpose, which we can simplify as, which we can write as h expectation f f transpose h transpose plus expectation h f n transpose plus expectation n f transpose h transpose plus expectation n n transpose. Okay, now, now let's assume that, 
Okay, now we right, one one additional thing. Okay, okay, that I should actually mention out here is that even though even though we said that right, we are going for simply a linear estimator, which means that we are probably doing suboptimal, right? But remember that if 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 f and g are jointly Gaussian, then this will also be the conditional mean, even though it is linear in g. And typically in our in our kind of observ and and those observation models where where noise is independent of the signal, everything is Gaussian. The noise is Gaussian. The the signal is modeled as jointly Gaussian, and the and the and the observation model is linear. It can be shown that f and g turn out to be jointly Gaussian. So in that sense, in most situations that you are dealing with, perhaps wherein noise is modeled as Gaussian, the signal can be modeled as Gaussian. The noise and signal, uh, and then the, the observation model is linear, and noise is independent of the signal. Then in such cases, it also it will also can also be shown that g and f are jointly Gaussian. In which case, even though you are only looking, and even though it looks like you are only doing a linear estimator, but then you are actually doing the conditional mean. Okay, so in that sense, the Wiener filter is still a still a powerful, uh, uh, still a powerful filter, right? So uh, we don't have to underestimate it simply because it's linear. Uh, now, assuming, okay, now it's safe to assume that uh, assuming assuming noise to be zero mean and uh, Statistically independent of independent of uh, the of your signal f, independent of f. Okay, because f is f is the one okay, which we are trying to estimate. Therefore, what will happen is, <coughs> right? So, so you see that see that the term here will go to zero. The f n transpose will be a zero matrix. This will go to zero. Okay, n f transpose. Therefore, what will remain is okay. This will go to zero for the only terms right that will remain are this. Okay, and uh, this. And this, okay, which will turn out to be now. Suppose, suppose we write R F to be the covariance. Okay, F F transpose is this, but the covariance of F, and therefore, if you write it as R F, or else, okay, let me just write this as expectation F F transpose into H transpose is equal to okay H hat H hat into what have we got here? H R F H transpose, H R F H transpose plus expectation. Oh no! Okay, let's write this as F F transpose. Okay, let's let me not let me bring in bring this in later. Plus expectation F F transpose H transpose plus <coughs> expectation N N transpose. And suppose we indicate the covariance of 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 your f as R f, then we get R f into H transpose is equal to H hat, which is your filter into H R f H transpose plus. Suppose we indicate the noise covariance is R n, then we have R n, and therefore right H hat will then be R f. So in this case, right, you have to multiply from the right into H transpose into H R f H transpose. Plus R n, the whole inverse. Okay, that will be your, that will be the, that will be the filter, right? H hat will turn out to be R f H transpose H R f H transpose plus R n, the whole inverse. Okay, now I would like you to notice that uh, that okay, the regularization part. If you are wondering where is the regularization, the regularization right has sneaked in in a kind of an implicit way. Look at this R n, right? Because of the fact that we we suppose we have some knowledge about the statistics of the noise. And if you can throw that in, then the then the then the Weiner filter can actually accommodate that in a very nice way. And and as you see, right, this is something that we have seen even when we did constrained least squares. Right, we used to we we would think of some term that gets added to this in order to improve the stability, in order to improve invertibility, in order to improve the condition number. All that is happening here, right? So which is why I said that you know there is a nice sort of a parallel between stochastic regularization and deterministic regularization. In fact, if you go through uh, go through a map estimator, right? A maximum, uh, you know, a posteriori kind of estimator. Then you can even, you know, do this regularization in a very implicit way. Uh, sorry, explicit way. Now in this case, right, regularization has happened in an, you know, implicit way. So this is your prior knowledge, okay, which is which is uh, which is gotten in, you know, prior knowledge improves, improves, uh, improves the, okay, improves the the. Uh, uh, the quality of your solution, right? So this quality of solution, f, okay, of your image, okay. So it's like 
So it's like really improving the numerical stability of this of this inversion process. And this entire thing is, as you can see, is in the spatial domain. And the, the Wiener filter is very general, okay, in the sense that, in the sense that, right, I mean, you can assume that all of this, right, so even if you have a space variant blur and if you knew H, you could throw it in. The only tricky part is, you know, knowing RF because you might wonder who gives me the covariance. So the power spectral density, this is a Fourier transform of the autocorrelation function. I'll, I'll kind of talk about it right in a minute. But as of now, right, the spatial equation, okay, is, you know, you know can, can actually accommodate any kind of blur. No space invariant or space variant and so on, and your f hat, right? Of course, eventually will be h hat times g because g is your observation. Okay, so you have to multiply this filter, okay, with this. Now the spatial domain thing, right? Other than the fact that this prior, now I just want to also point out that if you use the if you use the a b c d inversion lemma, if you use a b c d inversion lemma, right? If you know what the a b c d inversion lemma is. Because you know here it looks like noise is the prior. Now RF, right? You may think is RF really a prior? You can even show that there is a dual role. If you use ABCD inversion lemma, that is A plus B C D, the whole inverse. If you see this equation here, it has exactly the same form. Rn is A, H is B, RF is C, H transpose is D. Then then this is A inverse minus. Okay, this is a kind of a kind of a nasty thing. A inverse B into C inverse plus D A inverse B, the whole inverse D A inverse, right? So your head might swoon. I mean, if you look at this inversion lemma, but but uh, but uh, no, but then right, it's not so bad. So if you use this inversion lemma into this equation, play a small little trick, then you can show that, then you can show that H hat, right, can be equivalently written as, H hat can be equivalently written as, let me just write that down, write the equation down. Uh, it can be written as H transpose Rn inverse. Okay, this I just leave it to you to show. H plus Rf inverse, the whole inverse into H transpose Rn inverse. Okay, so as you can see, now another way to look at it is that the prior, right, which is in terms of the image information, the covariance so on, which is some kind of a statistical information, if that can be brought in, Right, so either it can come in this form as we have seen here, or it can come in this form. Right, in either case, it is it is a prior that is actually entering into the picture, right, in order to be able to improve the estimate of uh, estimate of your f.